friends, welcome to Viewpoint from Overseas. I am your host, Ms. Bazam. With me, Riaz Haq and our old friend who was absent from Viewpoint from Overseas for some time because of his personal engagements, Ali Hassan Samanto joining us on Skype. Today we will talk about the recent demise of uh, human rights activist Ms. Asma Jahangir. Some years ago she was visiting in the Silicon Valley and we had an opportunity to have more than one sessions with her and we had a very good one-in-one -one conversations with, with her. So I will talk to my panelists and uh, we will we will present some tribute to her. Then we will talk about, predominantly, we will be talking about Afghan, Pakistan and India. The all situation, overall situation, how the game is played over there, what are the chances there and what are, and what is actually happening there at this moment. With that, I would also like to ask my panelists about the recent uh, sit-in by a tribal area people who were protesting uh, in Pakistan. It, it, the sit-in was in Islamabad. They were protesting about the uh, murder of one of uh, the Masood young men. So, uh, Riaz, uh, let me start from you. What do you think, what, how, what do you want to say, what do you say about uh, Ms. Asma Jahangir? Yeah, there's no question that uh, Asma Jahangir uh, was a very brave woman. Uh, she uh, always spoke truth to power. Uh, she had uh, no fear. Mm -hmm. And she gave voice to those who had no voice. Uh, she sought justice for causes uh, that uh, were not popular. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think her uh, uh, passing is a great loss for the country. Regardless of whether you agreed with her or you didn't agree with her, I think her voice was an important voice in mm -hmm. Pakistani society, and it will be missed. Uh, Samantar, uh lot of people uh, say that that uh, it was like after Fatma Jinnah, Benazir Bhutto and then Asma Jahangir. How you see that? Uh, definitely I agree with Riyaz Haq that it is a big loss and especially for women in Pakistan because she was definitely a very powerful voice in women and that kind of voice is mostly absent in the Pakistani society. But, you know, uh, many commentators called her a liberal, uh, you know, and, and thought that this, the, the comment was that mo liberal's mother has died. And I, I don't think that you can pigeonhole her that way. Her agenda was very obvious, and that was the voice of everybody in Pakistan, and it still is. And she wanted the rule of law, and she wanted the military to be accountable to the civilian government. And I think these are lofty goals and the effort and the struggle must continue towards these goals. Yeah, Ma Asma was a person who, if he, she was against somebody, but the same person, when they are in trouble, she stood up for them. And that type of people are very rare in the country. Yeah, I remember when, when everybody was going after Musharraf, she spoke up for him. That is true. Which uh, was a great shock to me. That's true. Because exactly. they believed that she being a liberal, she being an anti uh, military and anti-dictatorship person that's true uh, would uh, add her voice that's true uh, against Musharraf but she said no don't do this don't do this and not only that uh, Ansar Abbasi he yeah. he ran the full campaign against her yeah. but when his newspaper was 
in trouble. She is the one standing up, yeah. stand up for, stood yeah. up for, for them. So of course, like Riaz say and Samantor say that we will be missing her. She was a great asset for Pakistan, mm -hmm. and she will be there living in yeah. our. And a lot of people thought she was pro-Indian, but she actually went to Kashmir and she saw what was going that on. That is true. And she spoke against. And she that. spoke very she strongly about here. it. She's yeah. strong, very strongly about it, and her. So uh, she was not there. partial. I think uh, the, the problem that a lot of people had with her was that she stood up for causes that they didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what, you know, that's what conscience says, you know, when you speak up. So I think uh, th th this is clear that, that she uh, was not uh, a person uh, who uh, took sides uh, uh, on, on issues. She spoke what she thought was the right thing to say. And even if it was unpopular uh, with, with some people. So Afghanistan is getting a big problem in that region. Now for Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan, their relation as we know it is coming, it has a history of that going up and down and uh, from the very beginning of uh, the history. Nowadays the situation is that Afghanistan is in the Pakistan's point of view between U.S.-Pakistan relation, it is like a tail which is wagging the whole dog there as uh, CIA ex-official um, Mr. Greener said it in one of a couple of years ago when he was uh, giving his testimony. So now we have to see it, what would be the solution there. So Riaz, uh, may I start from you? Uh, how you see with Afghanistan and Pakistan, just quote some history and tell uh, where we are heading at in our relations with Afghanistan. Actually, a lot of the people who are new to this issue, uh, who just started covering it or just started talking about it in the last few years, uh, think uh, everything started in the 70s and the 80s. You know, uh, particularly the 80s when uh, there was a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan during the Cold War and the Americans and the Saudis and the Pakistanis uh, supported uh, the Mujahideen uh, to uh, push uh, the, uh, the Soviets out of Afghanistan. But actually the history of Afghanistan-Pakistan relations goes much further back. Mm. It goes to 1947. You know that uh, the area called Northwest Frontier Province, where the majority of the population is Pashtun mm -hmm. in Pakistan, is divided from Afghanistan by a border called the Duran Line. Duran Line was created uh, by uh, a British official by the name of Sir Henry Mortimer Duran after the great game between the British, British and, and, and the, the Russians yeah. when they agreed to create, uh, basically have Afghanistan mm -hmm. as a buffer state between the British Empire and the Russian Empire. And as uh, part of that, they uh, reached an agreement uh, with uh, uh, Amir Abdurrahman, who was uh, the leader of Afghanistan at the time, to, mm -hmm. to draw a border that cut through the Pashtun territory, mm -hmm. basically half of it in Pakistan and the other half in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. cut the population as well. So when Pakistan was created, Afghanistan was the only country that voted against Pakistan's admission into the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was a lone vote. Yeah. Then, and also there was this Pakhtunistan movement there was actually a referendum held uh, at the time of the, before the time of the partition mm -hmm. in 1947 to decide whether or not the Northwest Frontier province, that region where the Pashtun lives in Pakistan, but Pashtuns live, whether or not should, should join Pakistan. And that referendum, the majority of the people that voted to join Pakistan. Yeah, but they claim that they did not put the question that whether they want to be separate entity. Okay, yeah, so whatever they, the, whole the, the referendum was, true. the result was that the people who wanted Pakhtunistan, uh, they lost hmm. and they joined Pakistan. So after that, there was this Pakhtunistan movement, Wali Khan, Ghaffar Khan, these people, they were supported. Hmm. 
uh, by the Afghan government at the time. Mm. And not only uh, the Afghan, but the Indian government also supported their mm. movement because their, you know, their leader, Afar Khan, was actually called, called uh, Frontier Gandhi. Mm. Uh, so, and then actually they actively tried to create trouble in Pakistan. Mm. Uh, there were a number of instances where uh, Daoud Khan actually sent uh, militiamen, uh, uh, militants and troops across the border in Pakistan and in Fata area, mm. particularly Bajor, there was an invasion mm -hmm. uh, which was routed. They were actually throw, pushed back. Mm. So this, they, they made a lot of trouble. Mm. And more recently, there's a book that came out uh, by uh, an Indian uh, spy, uh, ex-spy, uh, his name uh, is R.K. Yadav. He's written a book called Mission R.A.W., mm -hmm. Research and Analysis Wing of India. And he, in, the, in that book, confirms that there were several meetings between Khan Abdul Wali Khan and the Indian intelligence officials in European capitals uh, in which they not only provided funding but other support as well. Uh, to Wali Khan, mm. uh, to f basically in, in support of the uh, of the Pakhtunistan mm. movement. So the problem goes much mm. further back, mm. and then of course you know the Soviet invasion. Mm. So the the reality of Afghanistan, the way we see today, is these Pashtun nationalists, particularly mm. secular Pashtun nationalists, as well as the Tajik and the Uzbeks. Mm. They are they don't like Pakistan. Mm. They, uh, they basically hate Pakistan. Mm. There was a British major who served three tours of duty mm. uh, in Afghanistan. And he says that all he heard from the, uh, uh, particularly the Afghan army was that one day we're going to invade Pakistan mm. and we're going to erase mm -hmm. Doran Line mm. and take uh, the, uh, uh, take the Northwest from, in fact, they even say they want to take Baluchistan as well. And they want to create a path mm. uh, to the sea uh, from mm. Afghanistan mm. so that it's no longer lone law. So this is the kind of talk that's been going on that has created a lot of problems for Pakistan. Yeah, someone told me. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely all that history is there. But unfortunately, you know, all this history is quite irrelevant today, Ms. Ma. And I point out to you, you know, you mentioned something about the sit-in near Islamabad. You know, one thing we should always remember is that no country should take its geography for granted. If you don't treat your people well, then they have other options. There would be issue of Pashtunistan, there would be issue of this, you know, this kind of nationalism and that kind of nationalism. And unfortunately, the state of Pakistan is doing exactly the same. It is basically doing things which is increasing the anti-Pakistan sentiments in you know, these groups, as we saw in the case of the recent sit-in. Why all these people came from, you know, they started from Dera Ismail on other places, and they all they came, and they were sitting in Islamabad in very cold weather. Because the way people are kidnapped and without any trial, they are killed. Obviously, nobody would like that, and these people are not liking it either. So what the situation is that there is an army operation going on in Waziristan, and people, peaceful people, they are fleeing, and where would they go? Obviously, there are opportunities in Karachi, and Karachi is definitely the biggest first one city mm -hmm. in the world, so they go there. But then they are hunted there too. For example, this guy, Nabibullah Masood, the way he was picked up by the police and then later his uh, body uh, was found. So what I'm saying is that all this history about this animosity and that animosity and this one against Pakistan, that is, you know, there, but the ground reality is what is Pakistan doing to make these people happy? If you are not treating your people well, if you don't have rule of law in your country, obviously anybody can do anything in your country to break the country. Mm. And, and this is where Pakistan should learn and do things instead of doing things in Afghanistan and having part there. No, don't. As Riazov said, people don't like Pakistanis in Afghanistan. So just pull out from there if you have an influence and do and have all your efforts in making it a better country for everybody in you know, Pakistan. That's, that's the way it should work.
so uh, uh, so uh, recently uh, when uh, can, I, can I respond oh to yeah that? sure 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 go ahead I think this issue of Naqibullah Masood is not really an ethnic issue the fact is that in Pakistan police have been killing people in extrajudicial manner in encounters there's a long history of that it's not new mm -hmm. and this person that is responsible for it this time his name is Rawan Rawan he's killed a lot of uh, MQM leaders too and MGM activists. And it's not limited to Pathans or Mahajirs. It goes on in Punjab as well. Mm -hmm. There are so many people killed in these encounters. The way the politicians in Pakistan work, and this is basically, I, I laid down at, laid at, the, at the feet of the politicians. You know this guy, Arav Anwar, who is mm -hmm. accused of killing mm -hmm. Naqibullah Masood, is very close uh, to uh, Zardari. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a People's Party man. And he was actually pulled up from a very low rank and raised up yeah, very high true, that, by Zardai. Yeah. Because he has been serving uh, his particular yeah. interests. Yeah, initially people were even saying that to yeah. find him in the Bilawal house or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, and, and that's actually known. This is yeah. known history. Yeah. In fact, several times he was uh, disciplined. He was actually removed. Yeah. He was suspended. And all the time and then he, he came back. back and he used to say that, that, hey, you can do what you want. Yeah. You know, I, I know Zardari, so yeah. you guys can't do anything to me. So this is a situation. And now all of a sudden, because, you know, it's an opportunity for people in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. particularly even Ahmed, Ahmed, even, even uh, Ashraf Ghani has spoken up about yeah. it. They see it as an opportunity to create trouble in yeah. Pakistan. So this, I don't see this as an ethnic issue. I don't see, think this is an issue of Pashtun versus mm -hmm. non-Pashtun. Yeah, but Indian media was spread. Was so that's, see, that's, that's, that's the a, point. That that there's, there's a fault line. Yeah. Every country has yeah. these ethnic divisions. Yeah. But countries that are hostile to yeah. Pakistan, such as yeah. India and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. they are actually using it and they have been using it for a long yeah. time. And, and uh, This issue actually was almost dead. Yeah. In, in fact, it is dead. Yeah. They're trying to revive this particular Pashtunistan issue yeah. because they see an opportunity here with one incident. Yeah, but uh, those people over there, they were never, I, I was hearing their speeches, you know, they were never being talking to anything like that, close to that, what was being portrayed that, uh, you know, it is a Pashtun issue. They were saying they had a lot see, of that's issues. The point, they have that issues. people who want to make use yeah. of it, they're, use, they're making use of it as an issue to create trouble mm -hmm. in Pakistan. Uh, that's true. So, and I think it's not going to go anywhere. I mean, they're going to have to go take care of this guy, Rao and mm -hmm. Because, you know, you know where, when he became prominent the first time? During Benazir Bhutto's government back in the 1990s, uh, when he was actually uh, working uh, uh, for uh, Nasirullah Babur, essentially, you know, Nasir, he was a low-level guy, but he was part of the uh, of the squads that were kill that Nasirullah Babur used yes. to kill yeah. the MQM leaders, to yes. kill Mahajirs. Yeah. So it's the same guy. Yeah, that's true. So, um, uh, Samantur. Uh, uh, how you yeah. see? Uh, did you did you want to do you want to say something? Yeah, what I want to say is that you know, I mean, yes, Ashraf Ghani spoke, or yes, the Indian media was covering it this way. But who cares? The problem is a Pakistani problem. Why do we have a country like this where you give gun to anyone, be it the police or the military? Yeah, and and and, and basically, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but basically that's what, uh, if you allow me, I will ask the question because that was exactly I, I was coming to. That, uh, first of all, these people have other grievances too because they had other uh, demands as well. It is not only the killing of uh, one person. Of course, that uh, blew it up, but uh, they had, uh, they have the problem of... Uh, uh, mines over there they say that their kids are dying and all that and government is not doing anything then the reforms of uh, of the tribal areas you know so if we will make ourselves that weak vulnerable of course the enemy will take advantage of that how do you see that uh, Samantur I would let you talk about it yeah that is exactly I mean basically you said the, the same thing which uh, you know I mean I have the same point of view that no matter who your enemy is, these are your people have the rule of law in 
your country, the thing that, you know, Asma Jahangi wanted. And there should not be any disappearances, you know, because a lot of people in South of Waziristan, that's what, what's happening with them, that people just get disappeared. Same thing we are seeing in other parts of the country. You saw it in Balochistan. We have seen it in Karachi. And I don't think it's only the police because, you know, I mean, just last week, this guy, Taha Siddiqui, uh, who, you know, uh, writes for Guardian, he was beaten up and this, suddenly this, uh, you know, bloggers, they disappear and if they get to go outside the country, who do they blame? Mm -hmm. They are blaming, you know, the army. So I think it is the duty of the army in order to clear its name, it should investigate and find out who are these people who are kidnapping people and making them disappear. Mm -hmm. This is an internal problem. Mm -hmm. That needs to be solved. Now, yeah, I, I want to come back to Afghanistan and Pakistan issue. So, Riaz, uh, where are we heading from here now between relation of Afghanistan and Pakistan? And please add U.S. also in that. Mm -hmm. That U.S.-Pakistan relations are all now hanging on Afghan-Pakistan issue. Yeah. So let me make a reference to a book that has just come out recently. Uh, by Stephen Cole. Steve Cole. It's uh, uh, titled uh, 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 Directorate S. Uh, and he basically, in that book, he cites a lot of, uh, you know, issues uh, that have extended, that, has, that have extended the U.S. war. You know, it's becoming uh, like a 17th year now of war. Longest war. The longest war. And it, it, there's no end in sight. So he basically cites a number of uh, problems. You know, he talks about uh, the divisions within Afghanistan, uh, the ethnic divisions, as well as corruption in the Afghan government. He talks about in Indian interference and uh, Indian use of, uh, you know, proxies against Pakistan. But the bottom line, he says, is that he basically lays it all at the feet of, uh, of the ISI, mm -hmm. and particularly his Directorate S, which he says is a group, uh, is a particular, you know, a group within ISI that is uh, carrying out the, uh, uh, the war, uh, uh, the, uh, basically the, uh, uh, the secret war mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and elsewhere. The, the problem that I see, you know, if you read that book, one of the things he starts out with is that there were two reviews held during first uh, during the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, and then a second one uh, under Obama. And uh, they basically asked the question, what are America's vital interests in the region? In the region. Why are we there? Why are we giving, spending so much money and uh, sacrificing lives, American lives. Uh, what, is, what is it that's worth dying for for us in this uh, particular conflict? Each time they came back with basically two goals. The first goal, they said, and each, both times they said, the first goal is uh, that they want to maintain Pakistan's stability. And in fact, uh, because of its nuclear yeah, arsenal, whole quotes, that, uh, that's true. Uh, uh, Biden, Joe Biden, a former vice president of the United States, is saying that Pakistan is 50 times more important to the United States than Afghanistan. And then he says the second goal was, is, as far as vital interest to concern, is to deny any opportunity in space to Al-Qaeda to launch attacks against the United States. That's true. The problem that has happened is when the United States invaded, they actually pushed out a lot of these people who were making trouble in Afghanistan into Pakistan. And it was the Pakistanis who had to chase them down. In fact, they chased down a lot of the Al-Qaeda uh, operatives and, and leaders, and they handed them over uh, to the United States. They couldn't get hold of Osama bin Laden but the Americans themselves took care of that part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of it, they have actually created a problem. They actually defeated their first objective. Now, as far as the second objective is concerned about denying space to Al-Qaeda, there are so many other places where Al-Qaeda has taken hold. It's not just by, you know, Afghanistan or that region. Mm -hmm. They're in Somalia, 
you know, they're even uh, in, uh, you know, parts of, uh, of North Africa, uh, in sub Sub-Saharan Africa. So there are so many places where there's chaos, there's ungoverned spaces from where Al-Qaeda can launch attacks on the United States. And ISIS, not just Al-Qaeda, but ISIS too. So why is Pakistan so, why is Afghanistan so important? Why not just like, get out of there? Because, you know, it's just like any other space, just defend yourself here. So his answer to that is, again, this comes to the same thing. It's because Afghanistan is next to Pakistan and Pakistan has nuclear weapons. So if that is really the issue that the Americans are dealing with, what is the best way for them to bring stability to Pakistan so that it's, you know, their fear that its nuclear weapons are going to fall into the wrong hands, that fear uh, does not materialize. Mm -hmm. I think the best way for them is to basically figure out a regional solution to the problem. You know, don't take sides. Right now, the United States is taking sides. Is basically supporting the Indian government's presence there. In fact, so, you know, Trump is even asking the Indians to help in the process. That only complicates the issue. So, again, they cannot win the war. I mean, that's what this guy, Cole, also says. Mm -hmm. There's no way that America is going to militarily mm -hmm. win this war. I, I think it's our America. My own view is America has already lost the war. Mm -hmm. What they can do is try and bring the regional players together to hammer out a, a solution mm -hmm. to end this uh, this great game. In fact, this this is what uh, what uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the Holbrook just described it as. This is a second great game that's going on at this time. Uh, it's not just India and Pakistan; those are the key players, but there are other players there as well. Uh, and then again, you know, Cole also says the same thing, that this is a great game. Mm -hmm. So the, the way to end great games is to bring all the players together and sit them, sit them down and try to negotiate a solution that is acceptable to all the players. Mm -hmm. uh, Samantha. Yeah, no, I, I uh, understand, you know, this, this, uh, the, the uh, tough situation that the U.S. is in. But at the same time, I think that Pakistan should not have any problems in how the Afghan situation is handled and if it is handled with the help of other countries in this, in the region, especially India, then Pakistan should not have any problem because the end goal is to have some kind of stability in Afghanistan, which is, which would be a good thing for Pakistan. And what it looks like is that if these countries, Pakistan and India, are so much against each other that they consider Afghanistan as a theater of this whole war, then definitely things are not going to be sorted out. What is needed is independent of the U.S. What is needed is a cooperation between India and Pakistan in making Afghanistan is stable, and that is what is needed. Uh, two weeks ago, Riaz, I talked to uh, Ambassador Hogland. I asked him the question that why not U.S. just take a huge military, seal the borders, and go there and resolve the problem once for all. So. Uh, Ambassador Hogland kind of ruled out this center. He said that, look at it, when we were over 100,000 troops, we could not do. So talk is the only thing we can uh, proceed with. Anyways, just days after this interview, President Trump openly say all he's going to do is to look for the uh, war options. <laughs> How you say that? Well, I think that is a problem right yeah. now. That so, you know, my question is that diplomats word has no meaning now. Exactly. Th that's exactly the problem right now. You know, now he wants to have a military parade mm -hmm. in Washington and he's increasing the military budget by 15 percent and cutting the State Department budget by 30 percent. See, they have not so, even hiring. So you see, uh, you see the, the direction he's going. Yeah. So I don't expect things to get any better. He wants to basically be more confrontive, confrontational. Now they're talking about putting Pakistan on some watch list uh, for financial, uh, you know, 
uh, for money laundering and that kind of stuff were terrifying. Pakistan so, was there for uh, yeah for three, three years, years before. And took off. It didn't you know? It didn't make make no damn difference. You know. Yeah. Now they want to do it again, and I don't think it'll make much difference this time either. But they can try. Mm -hmm. See, he is the problem is that the diplomats in the United States are essentially totally neutered. Mm -hmm. They have no power. All the power is in the hands of the generals. And that is exactly the wrong recipe. And that, that thing started from uh, President Bush when he started sidelining the State Department. Right, but, but he realized, and, he, then, and, and then particularly mm -hmm. Obama realized uh, that it was a, such a folly, mm -hmm. and he brought in uh, Holbrook. Holbrook actually had some very good ideas. That's much more diplomatic. You know, in fact, if you read the Cole's book, uh, the guy that I find mm -hmm. most credible, yeah. the guy who seemed to understand this mm -hmm. best and had Mm -hmm. could find a way forward uh, was Holbrook. Yeah, I already ordered the book. I will get it. Uh, Samantur, I want your comment on that. Then we will wrap yeah, up. Yeah, so I, I won't say that there is no diplomacy in this uh, Mizpa, but I would say that it's the old policy that for a long time the U.S. had, which was to speak softly and carry a big stick. So the only thing what Trump wants to do is not only carry a big stick, but talk, but talk also, hard also. Yeah, keep waving it too. And this is the policy that they are applying on North Korea. And uh, Tennyson was here and he was proud that now people are, are dying of starvation and there are, you know, fishermen's boat found with a dead fisherman mm -hmm. uh, that just uh, drifted in, in, you know, in the sea and was found by the Japanese. So that is their diplomacy, which is basically show a lot of might, and but without the war, try to solve the issues this way. Uh, but uh, in North Korea, they are still they are at the verge of losing the South Korea as well. Now we are losing South Korea as well because uh, South Korea realized it <laughs> that you know it could cause a trouble there. So they start having a dialogues with North Korea. So how it is so. Uh, favorite policy, why we are pr pursuing such policy then? Definitely, and I think not only South Korea, even people in Guam would also think because Guam is really close to, uh, you know, North, I mean, that area, and, and uh, if ever North Korea fires, uh, uh, you know, a middle, then it would be headed towards Guam. I think that people who are close to that region, they definitely have a different thinking different viewpoint about how this issue needs to be resolved but if you are far away sitting here in Washington feeling out of the range of any North Korean level then you would have a different policy. Yeah but that's not true either I, I think the United States is within its, within its range. Uh, you are talking uh, about North Korea. Uh, yeah, but of course the main destruction would be in the peninsula. Yeah, yeah. I mean they'll be the Sunday. most affected. They will be the but affected, uh, yeah. we shouldn't feel so comfortable yeah. here. Yes, yeah, that's true. So, ladies and gentlemen, you heard the. Uh, this is just uh, like a one small part of the show. We will be talking about it in coming days and uh, bringing more information. We are going to meet more people uh, who are uh, involved in the U.S. government here in some ways outside or inside and uh, get their views also on these issues uh, in coming days. So please keep watching Viewpoint from Overseas. I am your host, Misbah Azam. <laughs>